Good day, and welcome to You Talk. I'm your host, Ryan Funk. You Talk is a program dedicated to diversity, highlighting native born and new Canadians' cultures and experiences. Over the pandemic's duration, many human there have been many human rights violations. Discrimination and racism have come to the surface, and other communities have come together to fight against hatred. There was the Black Lives Matter movement after George Floyd's death, and recently rallies have begun to stand against the increase of anti-Asian racism. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg, Manitoba shares the stories of human tragedy and triumph and brings the conversation of humanity's rights to the forefront. Maureen Fitzhenry is the media relations person at the museum. We discuss how they dealt with COVID-19 restrictions and the importance of bringing our communities together to improve everyone's lives. And so what I do is try to interest media in um, doing stories about uh, the museum and the things that are going on at the museum. So that's uh, news media, but also travel media. We spend a lot of time uh, doing that because we want to try to attract presentation, of course. Uh, I got into this because I've got a background in journalism and um, communications and media relations. So when the museum was being opened back in 2014, like in the years leading up to that, they were looking for communications and media relations people to help them get the word out about the museum in a positive way and to try to get uh, stories out there. So I thought what a fantastic place that that sounds like to work, to be pursuing such an amazing goal as promoting and educating about human rights, which are so important. So I uh, was thrilled to be able to uh, get the job and come work. That's why I've been there eight and a half years now. How, how have you enjoyed that time? I've enjoyed it a lot. I mean, there's certainly been challenges um, in terms of issues management because of the nature of a human rights museum. There are many things that come up. Um, you know, on a very regular basis, uh, because quite rightly, people are passionately interested in human rights and passionately interested in seeing their stories told in a national museum like this. Uh, and so, um, you know, we sort of welcome those ongoing discussions. Um, and we also want to be seen to be um, handling ourselves in the right way. So um, there have been issues come up recently where um, present and former staff felt that uh, within the workplace of the museum itself, that things were not going the way they thought they should for a place devoted to human rights. And so, you know, a lot of media attention to that, and rightly so, and um, really helped us get on a good path, I think. Uh, but really, um, what we've spe I've spent more time doing is the good stuff about um, just what an, uh, the amazing stories that we have been trying to tell and that we have been telling and the beautiful museum and just getting interest from like across the country and around the world really to uh, this iconic place here in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. I, I know before the uh, pandemic uh, caused everything to uh, close, my girlfriend and I you know, we loved going to the Human Rights Museum mm -hmm. and just checking out the exhibits. Uh, I think one of our earlier dates, we visited the uh, yes. Mandela and Apartheid in uh, South Africa. Yeah, we were very proud of that exhibition because it was the first uh, large scale exhibition that uh, we did, like that wasn't uh, from... Um, somewhere else, a lot of our traveling exhibitions in that space were either wholly brought in from another organization or institution, or they came in and we adapted them in some way, but Mandela was um, completely ours. I mean, with a lot of collaboration with the Apartheid Museum in South Africa. That's now traveling itself too. So it's traveled to a few places. I think it's in Chicago right now. It was in Toronto and it was in Houston. So. closures they've uh, affected everyone uh, how has it uh, affected the museum you know it's been it's been over a year now yeah the pandemic's had a dramatic effect uh, on the museum like like on everything and on all cultural institutions in Canada and the world um, so the museum closed down for the first time in March uh, reopened in June 
uh, then closed down again at the end of October and uh, just, uh, you know, reopened again in, in February. So that's a lot of time closed out of the year. So obviously, the things that we would normally be doing on site, welcoming visitors, having events, people coming for lunch, shopping in our boutique, having on, you know, public programming and schools on field trips, none of that was happening. Uh, during the times that we were open, we didn't, we weren't even able to offer group tours. So, you know, the numbers of people on site have been dramatically down on um, something like less than 10% of the visitors that we would normally get. Um, I mean, we've been closed, what is it, six months at least out of the total year. And then, of course, earned revenue down too. So that's been sad for everybody. But we did try to do a few things. Um, and there's a couple of really positive stories um, in the midst of all of that which I can get into. <laughs> uh, of course. I, I'd love to hear, you know, uh, what was done to help re reduce the impact because, you know, we, we hate to see, like, institutions like this, you know, uh, hurt economically. Right. So, well, one of the smaller-ish things we did was uh, mount an outdoor exhibition last summer of uh, art done by Manitoba youth artists about human rights. Um, we had put out a public call and attracted artworks from all across the province. And we took 26 of those and mounted them on giant billboards all throughout the forks. So that was one way that we could do something to help keep uh, um, engaging people in human rights conversations. Uh, but really this, the big story and the amazing story to me is what happened online. Uh, because uh, I'll start from, when we first closed in March, our online visitation just tanked. No one was coming to the site because they were visiting. So they weren't coming to see when the museum open or what's going on there. But then in June, something happened. Uh, George Floyd was killed in the US. And there was a gigantic outcry. There was the Black Lives Matter protest. There was huge activity and huge interest. Everyone started Googling black people, black people in Canada, slavery in Canada. And they came across the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, our stories about slavery in Canada, our discussions, all the kinds of um, explore from home things. And suddenly our website visits just went up exponentially in June, July, and August. Then in September, and here's the other part of the story, school started again. What do teachers need in school? They're trying to teach remotely. They're trying to reach kids at home. Or maybe if they do have them in classes at all, they can't go on field trips. They can't, you know, they are coming to the Museum for Human Rights as well. They're looking at our stories, our reflective questions, and our virtual field trips. We mounted virtual field trips before any of this started, we were trying to attack attention to them so that people from all across the country could participate as well. You wouldn't have to be in Manitoba. They went through the roof. Teachers wanted to have that thing for their students. So we had had field trips, that, that thousands and thousands of students participating in field trips. We're fully booked right now, right to the end of the year, all day, every day, year with all, all, all day, every day with our program interpreters, leading kids in person, live with that iPhone on a gimbal arm, going through the museum and doing all the same things that they could do if they were on a field trip. So both of those things have been absolutely fantastic for the sort of reach, the awareness, and uh, the kind of you know, human rights education that we can keep on delivering. Yeah, if this pandemic has shown one thing, it's just, you know, uh, allowing people's creativity to come to the forefront and able to, you know, continue to offer services that they were not, you know, uh, able to do like they did before. Yeah, because there was three things that stood us in good stead, which was that we had the foundational work. Our website was already set up to be an offering of human rights stories and experiences. It wasn't so much a website about the museum and how do you visit and what's your hours. And then the other thing is the virtual field trips foundational work had already started. But then when the pandemic hit, they pivoted, they responded, those teams really quickly and ramped it up. We had whole sections called Explore from Home and, and Learn from Home. We had recorded virtual tours of the museums. We had 
uh, lesson plans for even when our staff couldn't be in the museum, they were teaching kids from home. So, you know, it's all kinds of things like that. Mm -hmm. So you have these uh, virtual tours uh, and you've been open since February. What are some other things that uh, the museum is doing now that you're open? And what do people need to know if they come to visit? So we have strived very hard to keep things very safe. So we've got lots of room for people. That's number one. It's one of the bigger public spaces, indoor public spaces in the city, certainly as a cultural institution. Uh, So there is room to breathe, room for social distancing. Like there's no problem in that regard. You can be alone in the galleries almost these days um, and have that experience. We're doing time ticketing as well, though. So if there's any danger that there might be too many people in the building at once, that we would be able to control that through time ticketing. Uh, We're offering discounts for people to do that online, to buy their tickets online so that they are buying a time ticket and so that they're reducing that interactions with their hands and with people on site. So those are some of the things. Um, our touch screens are back open. We had to close them for a while. That was the rule of the province that any sort of t- things that people touched, we should close. But they're back open with um, a lot of strict cleaning protocols in, in place and lots of opportunities for people to sanitize their hands before and after. And um, the other thing that we've been doing is uh, getting ready to uh, open new exhibition that we're going to have a major one opening uh, at the end of April and uh, another one in June and a smaller one a little bit later on in the year as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you give us a maybe a little uh, sneak peek of what we can expect in some of these exhibits? For sure. So the one that's opening at the end of April is going to be a major exhibition. It's actually two exhibitions in one in that same level one temporary gallery space where the Mandela exhibition was. Uh, part of the exhibition is called Artivism, and it's about the way art can be a form of activism for human rights. So in the wake of mass atrocities and genocides all over the world, artists have responded, and we take six examples from Bosnia, Herzegovina, from Iraq, from Argentina, Indonesia, South Africa, and right here in Canada, with uh, Indian residential schools. So those six sort of uh, areas of the world, we, we are displaying artworks that have compelled people into action. We're talking about how art can be a force for change in a way that uh, you know many other things cannot be. And the artworks themselves are not just a painting. I don't, in fact, I don't even know. Yeah, there are some paintings, but they're amazing art installations. There are paper mache masks of Yazidi women who were captured uh, and kept as conjugal slaves in cages. There are 8,000 tiny coffee cups representing each one of the young men who was killed or disappeared during the Srebrenica genocide. There are golden ears representing ears that were cut off by the perpetrators of genocide in Indonesia when communists were um, attacked. There's a beautiful embroideries from South Africa where women use their ability to, to make beautiful needleworks to tell the story of what was happening under apartheid as their form of protest. And from Canada, there are artifacts that were contributed to the truth and reconciliation hearings, um, um, objects that represented Indigenous traditions that were ripped away by residential schools, and a particular exhibition that's made of birch trees that we actually helped harvest ourselves here in Manitoba with a baby cradle, connecting it to the wall and poetry that has to do with um, surviving those residential schools plus the healing quilt. So really quite powerful um, works of art um, all throughout. Yeah, uh, visual media can definitely have that, you know, powerful impact on people when you see it. Like instead of just reading words, you, you, you see that and like the emotions that the people put into it and you can just you can feel what you uh, they feel. I, I know, like, during the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protests after, uh, you know, uh, uh, George Floyd was uh, killed, you know, the can't breathe uh, slogans and artwork 
placed all up there and just uh black lives matter uh uh on the the streets in uh uh washington powerful stuff yeah that's right and you're quite right there it's very emotive and we also have there's also film and video in there there's soundscapes the other Part of that uh, exhibition that's going on is the return of the witness blanket, which is a an amazing, beautiful, powerful, and disturbing work of art. A forty foot long, eight foot tall cedar framed uh, installation that looks like um, a quilt or a woven blanket, and embedded with eight hundred objects that were collected from the sites and survivors of all of the res Indian residential schools that stood in Canada. So it uh, really has um, a powerful effect. And we're gonna be talking in this form of this exhibition about the conservation work that's been underway for that. Um, and the conservation work underway and, and how we're trying to preserve um, those stories. Mm -hmm. Of course. For future generations. So the mu museum has been operating for, for six years. How has it matured as an institution over this time? It's um, really a pivotal time in the development of the museum because we've been open now for, well, six years. So the first five years were really this time of, of learning how to run a national museum, to organizing and building all that up, to you know, after opening, getting all those things in place, creating everything and throwing our doors open, plus lots of new exhibitions. Uh, the, the next five years, which we're now in, are a new phase, a phase of, okay, we've, we're in place. Now, what is the best way for us to be delivering on our mandate of, of human rights education? How can we best engage with community? What are some of the stories that we need to be telling now? How can we um, present contemporary human rights stories that people are really concerned about today? So that's the kind of work we're undergoing now is to really be this national platform for those diverse voices and of the community and uh, what people want to hear be told. And not just on site in exhibitions, but in public programs and online. Yeah, you have to be uh, really attentive to, you know, what uh, the community wants and, you know, what is needed to tell these stories, because there's not really a how-to manual <laughs> to figure it out. There isn't. And to tell you the truth, human rights is so broad, right? It's everything. It's how we treat our neighbors here in, in Winnipeg and our own communities, right out to things that are happening on a large scale during war, you know, in countries around the world. Um, so from the smallest points to the largest points, and you know, everyone matters and it, it all matters, uh, all of those stories. And so obviously we can't do everything at all points in time, but we want to try to find ways to, to have the discussions that will make people realize the importance of human rights for all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, through Black Lives Matter uh, and, you know, the the increase in, in uh, recent uh, uh, Asian hate, uh, you know, combating systemic racism, it, it's important. And you mentioned before the museum committed to combating it uh, within the workplace. You know, what sort of steps are in place and how do we, you know, continue that conversation to move forward? Um. Yeah, and, and I think that that's one thing that really helped everyone during the Black Lives Matter um when it first started, I mean, it's still going on, thank goodness, uh, it really made people think about their own attitudes, their own biases, their own, um, you know, maybe uh, unconscious biases uh, in, in the way that racism gets perpetuated in ways that people don't even understand. And I think some of those things were even happening, and I, well, I know they were because we were told they were, and uh, people have shared a lot of stories in, in the workplace of the museum itself. Um, and so I think the point is creating lasting change requires a deep commitment to challenging the way we do things. Um, it's easy to think that we have to, that we can just change a few things, um, uh, put a few rules in place 
and, and and that's the end of it. But it can't be. And so we're approaching this really thoughtfully as an organization, gathering input from employees and the community. Uh, we released a in November a, a big comprehensive framework plan on how to move ahead that involves everything from training to staff for staff to um, reviewing the content of our exhibitions. And in particular, actually right now, looking at it with uh, members of the black community in Canada to, to see uh, how we can do a better job of telling those stories. Um, and we plan to, to keep do, taking that sort of approach as well. But, but um, I think we can help as a museum uh, keep those conversations going um, to provoke conversation through having exhibitions that challenge people, through having public discussions and debates, um, and, uh, you know, have the national platform of this, of this Museum of Canada be something that really works as a tool for the community to kind of start seeing the change that we need to have in the world. Yeah, March 27th, there was a um, uh, a rally against uh, Asian hate. What are some other things um, people can do within the, the community to, you know, address just racism and injustices uh, as a whole? Well, I think as a, from a museum's perspective, again, we, we come back to talking. Um, so I think the worst thing is silence. And I think a lot of our exhibitions deal with that, the, the danger of just being silent and looking the other way. And so it's a matter of um, taking personal responsibility to learn and to reach out to others. Um, I've been saying things like, uh, uh, if you didn't realize that your friends and acquaintances who are people of color or black or indigenous have been experiencing racism, why don't you ask them? Like you can't expect them necessarily to come up to you and start launching into that kind of thing. I think it's up to those of us who enjoy white privilege um, to, to start that learning process to initiate it as well. So that's, uh, that's uh, I think, a powerful step. And then to use resources, you know, credible and trustworthy resources, because there's a lot of stuff out there and online that is not. Um, but uh, I, I can say with confidence that the museum is a, a, a credible resource. So to engage with us and um, uh, to find those paths forward and to, to together we can you know, talk about things and try to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So how can people get involved in supporting the museum and, you know, ensure we can continue telling all Canadian stories and, you know, just the, uh, uh, the, the things of human rights that people around the world have been uh, fighting for? Well, it's really not a matter of supporting the museum. It's a matter of supporting human rights and I think uh, the promotion of human rights. So if that's something that you care about, we think we've got a lot of good ways that we can um, contribute to that. So I think it's a matter of participating, participate in the things that the museum is offering um, on site and online. Uh, if you would like to support the museum financially, of course, that's also always welcome through the friends of the CMHR because um, the donations and uh, financial support we receive um, helps us do interesting and extra kinds of things. We, our operations are fully supported by the federal government because we are a national museum. So our donations just let us do more. You know, and maybe special things uh, that keep the lights on. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to uh, share just in regards into kind of the uh, initiatives and or uh, programming or exhibits that the uh, museum currently has? Well, I think I'm personally optimistic that we are going to we're entering a, a really good and positive phase all around. I'm sure we're coming out of COVID. We're going to start getting back into the sunshine. Uh, we're going to start, um, you know, making um, a, a difference too for the way that people think about human rights. I'm not saying that we're going to solve the human rights problems tomorrow, but I think I see it all around me that there's an openness now, more of an openness that people are thinking and saying, I, 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 I see what the matter is now. I, I think I'm, I'm understanding. So 
So that's positive. And, and then from the museum's perspective, we have um, another exhibition opening inside in June, which the uh, more of the art by Mani young Manitoba artists, all of that art that we couldn't get outside last year in the summer, we're creating an, that in an indoor exhibition, there'll be over 100 pieces. And we're also going to be mounting sort of a, a smaller um, showcase in our level two gallery on climate change and climate action um, is, is something that is um, supportive of human rights too. So I guess I would, would leave people with those little bits of um, invitation to come and see us uh, as, as things get better. If you have any stories you'd like us to share or communities we should highlight, leave a comment on our social media or reach out to us on our website. I'm Ryan Funk. This was Utah and have yourself a good one.